Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman is a podcast on directing for anybody that's quite simply ever watched anything. Pete converses with a wide range of fellow directors, writers, actors, showrunners, producers, executives, and more on a journey to determine just what makes a good director and why we'll always need stories. The Director is Pete Chapman's digital studio, built on the pillars of craftsmanship that ensure a unique vision. I'm talking about story, innovation, perspective. Learn more about The Director, and better yet, get your official director's chair wear by visiting www.drctr.video. That's drctr.video. All right, people, welcome to episode 35 of Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman. And uh, right now, I'm rocking on a new mic. I got a Shure MV7. Uh, I, um, I hope it elevates the way that we sound here, but um, I am welcoming you on my new Shure MV7 to episode 35, and this one will be not quite uh, a full craft episode, but uh, I'm your guy today. So let's shoot with Pete Chapman, starring Pete Chapman today. Um, we'll be back with other guests uh, in the coming week. Um, got a few more to record uh, actually this week. Um, but I have been pretty, pretty, pretty busy with um, everything related to Reasonable Doubt. Uh, I just wrapped episode 102, Nine Day Shoot. Uh, and, you know, uh, I'm getting into the, the flow of being a producing director. And as I mentioned uh, before uh, on a previous episode, um, that means I'm the guy that's there for every episode uh, throughout the season. Uh, I direct, you know, I'm directing two episodes. Uh, it, there is no set number, but you definitely, you tend to do, um, you know, more than any other visiting director when you're in that position. Uh, and oftentimes you'll get the uh, kind of larger uh, episodes with more moving pieces or um, that are kind of going to be more challenging. And uh, the fact that you're kind of in the family and you know the ins and outs of the cast and crew uh, make you a valuable um, asset other than, uh, you know, somebody walking into a scenario and having to shoot a season finale. Um, so I'll be doing a finale for this show as well uh, in a few months. Um, but what, what has that looked like for me? Um, that has been few days into my shoot, uh, the director of 102, the incomparable Nima Barnett started. And so she's prepping while I'm shooting and I'm hopping on Zoom meetings at lunch break or before um, before call time uh, when I can. Uh, sometimes like there are limits to, you know, you can't shoot a scene and be in a meeting. Um, and then uh, now that she's shooting, I'm there on set to offer support and um, what's really cool, in my opinion, is, and, and Spiller had mentioned this uh, back on an earlier episode of the podcast when we first began, Michael Spiller, um, fabulous director, former DP, uh, producing director right now on Firefly Lane, uh, last year, The Mighty Ducks. Um, and uh, he was saying how cool it is to watch another director do something that you haven't seen or you haven't thought of with the show. And so uh, already, I mean, we're only three episodes in, but uh, Nima and the DP Rob Arnold did a fucking dope shot uh, looking up through the glass on a glass desk as an important document was slammed down uh, in a legal case. And then uh, focus was seen on a suspect and then focus was racked to our star, Emiati Coronaldi, as she picked it up. And it was just uh, so efficient a, a creative choice while being uh, interesting to look at and having a style that should let you know that the show um, cares about the visual, the visual language. So there's that. Um, today, in fact, on uh, the damn recording, this is day one on our episode four director, Darren Grant. Uh, who's coming off Billions and uh, Raising Dion and uh, just another good brother. Um, so as you can see, this thing just keeps going and keeps going. And uh, he and I will get on the horn and kind of talk about things related to the show, catch up, and I'll be there to answer any questions that he might have. And 
one thing I'm proud of on uh, our show is a pretty thorough visual document that I've put together. So the directors, when they arrive, get a very clear, uh, uh, you know, breakdown on on the look and feel of the show, uh, the cast and crew and bios. We have notes from our pilot director, Carrie Washington, uh, that speak to the visual language. And it's been dope because I've already seen a couple shots that Mima did that I know are, are uh, driven by what Carrie sought out to do with the pilot. So that is uh, what's going on right there. Pardon me as I open my uh, sparkling water here. There you go, real live sound effects. And this week's installment of the business of being a director uh you know in between all of the above we're at the top of the year uh and i'll be on uh this show for uh several months and you know you always have to be looking around the corner and so what i've done since i was uh, a guy just trying to get into this game and have continued to do uh as i've found a little bit of a footing uh, I make a, a list of shows that I'm interested in. Last year was the first year that I think the majority of the episodes that I directed were, um, they were born out of me watching a show for my own enjoyment and saying, I would love to be involved with that show. So, um, you know, uh, that's how you came to be. Uh, those two episodes, that's how Love Life came to be, those two episodes. Um, and it's not like I'm just saying, hey, I want to do it and, I'm, and I'm, I'm selected. There's a great deal of preparation and all kinds of meetings. And I'm sure people are calling and, and seeing, hey, what do you think about that guy? Uh, he, we had a meeting with him. Uh, what's the deal? You know, uh, that was the that was a goal last year. Now that I, I, I've got proof that it can work, I am really, really, really trying to focus on that um, because it's really dope when when the jobs that you do are all shows that you're really, really interested in, in directing. So I put that list together. Um, gosh, I wonder if I if I would, if I'm bold enough to share it. I don't have it in front of me right now. And I, obviously I know what's on there, but there are, you know, there are shows like um, Succession and Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, um, Atlanta, Dave, um, uh, gosh, what else is on there? Um, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to give a diverse bit of content, but what what's a real target for me um, is to do a, premium streaming or cable uh, action or superhero uh, show, because I, I think that's the one thing where folks, you know, uh, in this game, it's often, well, you haven't done that, so you can't do that. Uh, I definitely want to take that kind of conversation off the table for action and, um, and you know, folks in capes and costumes, <laughs> because, uh, you know, I can rock it. And there are so many interesting shows in that genre that um, I'd love to have an opportunity to do. So I'm always kind of looking at what might be the quote unquote weak spots in the resume uh, to show um, that what people might think I can't do, I can. And it's no different from, you know, there was a point, there was a time when people said uh, Jordan was all offense. So then he goes and gets defensive player of the year. And then they said he can't shoot from long range. And so then he, he ups his three point field goal percentage. Um, and while I'm not comparing myself to Jordan, uh, I am saying that that kind of mentality is uh, is important. So appreciate where you are, obviously, but, you know, stay focused on um, how the how the game works and how you can pivot. So uh in this particular episode uh recently I, I asked on instagram whether uh people had any questions and if you're not following me i'm at pete chapman and uh i got a bunch of questions that i am going to answer right now roll sound speed the interview take one Action. first let me say um that my response is come from love. Uh, uh, I leave with the hope of having some small part in making you the best 
you know, fill in the blank that you can be writer, director, editor, um, with the two cents of advice that I could offer from my particular experience. Um, but because I'm just going to read these and reply, you may get a little bit of my unfiltered brain mixed with the more diplomatic version of me. So uh, somehow I hope that may give you a mixture of the grumpy old man answer and the supportive friend and career cheerleader all at once, which I think can be a pretty cool combination. So here goes. So this is from at the view through my lens. Has anyone approached you with dreams and nightmares they've had to turn into film? Uh, that I don't, I don't know if that's the case. Uh, I think that's the honest answer. Um, I know that a lot of times what if is the biggest driver of, uh, of an idea. Um, I don't know if anybody stepped to me with a particular dream or nightmare, but I, I would say, you know, there is the idea of uh, the what if sometimes scenario is a dream in the sense of imagining something in a, in a you know, maybe something could be better in life, but um, that's my answer right there. So uh, moving on to a question from at director Tyler. How do you run rehearsals? Any tips? Um, all right, director Tyler, that is a good question. Um, I will just speak with, uh, in, in regard to television. Um, first, uh, rehearsals in TV are, you know, you don't get a lot of time for them. So, you know, let's say you have, uh, you have your five to eight pages that you're shooting on any given day. And let's say scene 11 is up first and there's five people in the scene. Um, so once you finish the prior scene, um, you have what we call a private rehearsal. And at that moment, it's you, the director, obviously the cast, your assistant director, uh, your DP, and uh, your writer, showrunner, uh, anyone you know else representing the production. Your department heads, uh, like production design, uh, uh, sound, uh, wardrobe, uh, costume designer, they are not, they are not in on the private rehearsal because you're working out things that are related to the story. Um, and your DP is there because, you know, if you, <laughs> it's a little bit of an insurance policy, I imagine, because if you are not that familiar with the camera, uh, and the DP weren't in the rehearsal, you might set up a whole blocking scenario that's going to require 19 different angles. Um, so oftentimes they are, they might, you know, kind of whisper in your ear and be like, Hey, what if, you know, they don't move in on that other axis, which is going to require two more shots, you know, but uh, you go through, you read it first, just to get the word off the page. I strongly recommend, and this is kind of annoying, but I, I always do it. I read the stage directions because a lot of times, um, if you, I found that if you don't, beats of action can get blown past. Um, so I want to get from the first time that we kind of begin to put it on its feet and bring it to life. I want people to, you know, hear Bobby grabs his phone. Uh, uh, Jane takes a moment, looks in her eyes. Uh, and tries to hold the secret in. I'm, I'm making up bad scenarios here, but I find that if you don't read that, um, sometimes, you know, it just gets blown by and, and, and you might have to be in your second or third take before you begin to land it because people are not doing it. So I read the stage directions um, and I always have a plan. There is no scene for which I don't have a plan. Um, in TV, the currency is speed. And so what I personally do is I pitch my blocking. Um, and I say pitch because it's not written in stone. I mean, it kind of is in my mind, <laughs> but it's not written in stone because I know uh, what is most important in the scene. And I'm, I can kind of think on my feet and quickly pivot. Um, like if a person comes from another direction or now somebody wants to move and I hadn't imagined them moving there, I, you have to think on your toes and make it work. Um, if uh, there are a lot of people in the scene, that's where your your blocking uh, plan is really going to be important because uh, you really need to start directing people 
other rather than spending, you know, five minutes asking people what they think they're going to do, um, because they may not be thinking about it in a camera uh, and in a time sense. Um, after you have, uh, after you present that pitch, you walk through it, you know, you get on its feet with the actors and you see what happens. Um, there are liable to be questions. Um, it's a, it's an opportunity for you to kind of uh, talk through it and maybe say, oh, hold on right there. What if you do this? What if you do that? Um, and you just move to the rehearsal, get the blocking right. And then I think uh, different directors do this differently. Some will spend time in the rehearsal um, talking about character and motivation. I would rather just lock in the blocking and then on the way out, you know, after the rehearsal, when the crew has the set and can begin lighting and, and setting up cameras, I might have a conversation uh, about what is happening with the characters um, in more detail, because I don't want to take that time away from moving the chains forward to get to this production and shooting of the scene. So that's, uh, that's my answer there on how I run rehearsals. Those are my tips. Um, the ultimate tip, though, is be fucking prepared. Um, read that script, think about where people might stand, might sit, uh, interpret the script. There may not be uh, anything that says they go to the fridge and get a sandwich or grab a bottle of water or, you know, whatever. So think about how to bring life to what's on the page because in TV also, speed is the currency. And so that means page count, uh, page counts can be just, can be, um, eluding, elu well, that's not the word I'm looking for, deceptive. Page counts can be deceptive because um, oftentimes writers won't be as descriptive as they want to be because that's just going to make the script longer. So it really is important that you interpret and find ways to bring it to life for those characters. And it's important that you've watched the show and understand what those characters may or may not do. Um, I remember one of my uh, first Grey's Anatomy episodes, I was like, uh, oh, so, you know, Maggie and um, and Meredith and, um, uh, gosh, why does my mind just go into such a, a funk? Um, but another character, um, I was like, oh, we'll be here drinking. And then uh, the actress was like, uh, my character is an alcoholic, a recovering alcoholic. And I was like, that's right. Um, so a bit embarrassing, but um, there were 14 seasons of information that I had not fully digested in all honesty. Um, so, um, a question from Maddie Monch, uh, how did you start as a director? More like what got you interested in directing? Uh, Maddie Monch, I've got a book, Transitions, a director's journey and motivational handbook that answers that in full detail. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that there. Um, and I've, I've, I've spoken at length about that on the podcast as well. At Mir Joe, would love to, he to hear your thoughts on directors editing their projects. Directors editing their, editing their projects, um, I think is a necessary evil uh, when you're trying to get on. Uh, I think ideally in a perfect world, you just get something from having new eyes on what you spent so long directing. Um, I'm not a, I'm not a director who becomes precious to anything that I shot or wrote or whatever, but there's just the experience of, um, in the same way that an, an, an audience member, you know, 10 audience members take something different away from your film. Um, 10 editors will find something different in your film. And so I think in a, in an ideal world, you're trying to find, collaborators, right? An editor, a DP, a production designer. Those are all things you can also do yourself as a director. But in an ideal world, you're trying to find the collaborator that, you know, speaks your language and has a unique set of artistry, you know, artistic skills that complement what you do, um, uh, you know, elevate what you do, um, cover your blind spots. And together, Somehow, I, I feel like you end up having something that is your vision, you know, but, you know, elevated. And so um, edit your project if you must. I mean, I, I came up editing a lot of my shit. <laughs> um, and I think it's made me a better director because I know 
you know, I know what shot sequencing is. I know what I actually will need in a moment. Um, and that's very helpful. And again, I guess the word of this episode is becoming uh, your currency is speed, right? In television, your currency is speed. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think that uh, find those collaborators and work with them when you can. But don't let not being able to find them stop you from making your, your thing. Uh, from, oh, here we go. From random account 123231. How did you and Kelly come up with Indigo's name? Uh, I think that I'm, I'm going to pass on that question. Uh, but I will say the, uh, I, I came up, I'm a guy who goes by my middle name. Uh, not because my first name's Harville, just because I was never called it. And I remember growing up every first day of the school year, uh, hovering by the teacher's desk to make sure that when they did the roll call or did the attendance, they did not call me by uh, my first name on the uh, attendance sheet. And so uh, there were only a few people who knew what my first name was. Some people didn't know until they saw the fucking graduation yearbook. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I wanted, uh, personally, I wanted Indigo to have a name that would be cool um, uh, on top of have other meaning, which is personal for Kelly and I. Did your, this is from Raphael Nash. Did your experience in teaching inform how you pitch your projects? Um, absolutely. My experience in teaching informed how I pitch my projects. When I first started teaching at NYU, um, I mean, uh, my first classes were kind of mostly talking. Uh, they, like called, uh, they were called colloquiums, um, where it's like me at a podium. Um, but then as I transitioned into uh, teaching workshops and um, production classes, I was driven by this, uh, I don't know if, what's a quote, what's a mantra, what's an adage. I don't know what the difference is, but um, I was driven by this piece of paper on my wall that said, um, tell me I forget, show me I remember, involve me, I understand. And so pitching a project is very much the same. Uh, I can just tell you, you know, what the, what the premise is and what happens and who the characters. I could show you a pitch deck, which might help, but if I'm able to involve you in that pitch uh, and, and find ways to connect it to your general humanity and, and, the, and the collective humanity beyond that, it will resonate at a much higher level um, than if you're just, you know, spewing words at somebody. So that's how my teaching has informed how I pitch projects. Uh, Melly or Melee underscore 44. How can I get into directing? Uh, got a book, Transitions, A Director's Journey and Motivational Handbook. Anything I got to say is in there. Um, almost, and honestly, y'all, that's kind of why I wrote the book. I, I want to tell people, as, I want to tell as many people as possible about the journey and about, and about what I've learned. And it's just kind of nice now to be able to say, pick up the book. And uh, anything I would tell you, literally, I've worked months on the, on the writing and years on the uh, structure to give you my best answer to any question you would ask me about directing. And now, uh, this is from Sebastian Savino, who was a former, is, who is a former student of mine from NYU. For aspiring episodic directors, what's more important for a portfolio, a short or a feature? Well, Sebastian, hope you well, man. Uh, I will challenge your question with another question, which is what about a web series? Um, that isn't, that hasn't been included here. And I think, um, you know, if you're able to put together a web series that shows that you think episodically because in a world of, um, fear and insecurity, which is what I, uh, dub Hollywood, um, people want to hire you to do what you've done before. Um, no one wants to roll the dice on you unless they know you, um, or you have, such an amazing track record that rolling the dice on you doesn't fucking matter because it's just cool to say that you did it. Um, 
I think, uh, you know, having a web series is a great indicator of, oh, you can do something uh, episodically. So I think of um, a gentleman by the name of Jafar Mahmood, and he is currently the producing director on Young Sheldon. And uh, again, back to the book, I mentioned this story I'm telling you right now in the book. Um, but uh, he was a director in like a cycle before me, like one or two years before me going through the director programs um, and was like the guy before me who kind of transitioned into working professionally. And he told us about how he had made, you know, a feature, if I'm not mistaken, and a short and was finding it hard to uh, transition into episodic directing. And he made a uh, web series, I believe it was called Courtside, um, that was six episodes long. You can find it on YouTube. Um, and it was two dudes um, on the bleachers at a tennis court having a conversation, <laughs> you know, and you're following this kind of character driven journey, maybe five to six minutes per episode. And um, I don't think they got on the tennis court until the final episode number six, if I'm not mistaken. And what that was able to do for him was show people that he could direct episodic. Even if those episodes are five or six minutes, they are episodes, you know, the bigger stretch for people is when they see a short film, uh, you know, they're in a world of fear and insecurity there. People are kind of looking to apply reasons that make it safer to not do something than to do it, because everything is a risk in this business with a lot of money at stake. So, you know, your short film might say, you know, you're an amazing short film director, but it might also hint at the fact that, well, you're, you're a singular vision person and can you work and, uh, you know, not be the auteur and do something that is, um, you know, more writer driven. Um, well, if you do a web series, even if you are the writer behind it and it has an auteur feel as an argument, it still shows that you can think episodically and know how to weave story that uh, has to kind of continue through, you know, uh, multiple episodes in, a, in a, an extended length of time. So um, for aspiring episodic directors, what's more important for a portfolio, shorter feature, or, I say, or web series. And I think what's really most important is whatever you can make right now and how many of those things you can make right now over the next year, because you don't know what's going to hit. For me, it was a short film. It was Black Hard that became my calling card. Um, but guess what? Prior to Black Hard in 2015, I had a short film in 90, in 2001 at Sundance. I had a short film in 03. I had a feature film in 05. I had a feature film in 08. And, you know, this, and all of those things, uh, you know, were part of the journey, but it was a short film that propelled me into the director programs and ultimately into episodic directing. So thank you for your question, man. Hope all is well with you. Let's see. E. Rowe, 1959, E-R-O-W-E, 1959. How do you deal with the changes made in a director's cut on a TV series? Well, um, for those folks that used to come by our house when I would have uh, pre-COVID screening parties of events that I, of, of episodes that I had directed, um, I dealt with it by saying, oh, interesting choice, or huh, you really going to cut that? <laughs> or whatever it might be. Um, but no, I, you know, there's nothing really to deal with. You are hired to deliver um, your best interpretation of the show that the showrunners have created and that the writers have written. Um, and it's not about your cut. Um, ideally, if something is getting cut drastically from what you've you've put together um somewhere along the line you were off target for of what the show needed um and that doesn't mean um that doesn't have to be in a negative sense like they the prior episodes might have you know uh, revealed a particular chemistry with two characters and then in your episode they you know pulled back from another storyline because they wanted one that was beginning to shine uh in different ways on screen versus on the page, and they want to go in that direction more. So you never really know um, what what the reasons are. And you just have to, you know, I think the real thing to deal with is 
um, do you get invited back? Um, getting invited back to a show um, with the information, with the data of having, you know, directed an episode and then seen what has aired, what they have decided is the best representation of your work for the show, then you know that you can move forward in future episodes of that show and kind of um, uh, be more in the pocket and maybe adjust what you, how you design the episode to be more in line uh, and, and, and see more of what you prepped end up on the screen. Um, Raphael Nash. Is shooting material for spec useful or a waste of money? Um, I think these binary questions, you know, either or um, uh, questions uh, don't necessarily do us any good. Um, is shooting material for spec useful or a waste of money? Well, you could shoot a spec and it could end up turning into uh, like black card for me, you know, the thing that gets me into the industry. Now that costs $30,000. Um, was that a waste of money? If I hadn't gotten, uh, you know, if it hadn't turned into the story that it is um, today, I would say no. I think you have to redefine um, what your expectations are with every creative effort that you make. For me, I made that short with the expectation that I would see what I could do in a narrative sense, you know, in November of 2014, um, I could see just where my talents lied because I've been spending the last five years making things for other people, other clients. And, um, you know, I budgeted what I felt I could safely, um, you know, absorb, although it kind of ballooned a lot more. Um, but I needed to know what I could do. And I and I worked within parameters that I felt comfortable um, exploring. And if, if none of this happened, I would have had a short film that I could watch that was representative of my talents. And that's what the point was. So I think, you know, you've got to be very clear about um, what it does for you and having expectations that are that cannot be taken away. No one can take away what I've just mentioned, right? Um, if I'm gonna do, do a short film to practice a particular type of storytelling, no one can take that away from me because I will have accomplished that just by the virtue of having made the film. So, um, you know, don't blow up your bank account, but uh, also, um, and don't expect everything you do to be the, the thing that's going to propel you to, you know, Hollywood stardom. But um, make, 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 make a way. Uh, Rel Williams underscore film life. How do you become comfortable with directing actors? I'm always nervous when I have to give notes. Uh, well, I think the thing there is um, your preparation is key. Um, I will say though, let me let me back that up. I would say read Directing Actors by Judith Weston. Um, I think there's a 25th anniversary book uh, edition coming out uh, in March, perhaps. Um, that's a great book. Uh, read The Actors Thesaurus. Um, that's a great handbook that has a variety of uh, kind of active words for you to prompt different performances from your actors. So you don't have to be Freudian and or Carl Jung and, and have a 30 minute conversation about existentialism, you can just say, uh, let's try this one, you know, with a little more condescension or, you know, I think uh, if you're pleading in this moment, I, that plays better than being apologetic or whatever it is, right? Uh, so I think um, the more you are in the trenches with the script and the motivation and having all your questions answered, the easier it gets to give notes. Now, obviously I understand and I, I feel the same when I give my first note to an actor on a show, I'm often like, I don't know what I'm gonna receive. Are they gonna wanna hear it? Are they gonna be like, you know, give me the get the fuck out of here look? Like, um, you know, who knows? But I have to trust that the note that I'm giving is the best note to get what we need out of the scene. And what I get in response is just part of navigating that. So I think you have to put the work first 
Um, you will always be nervous. I'm nervous before every day of uh, first day of shooting on an episode because I don't know what it's going to be like. But I know that I'm prepared. I'm ready to do the work. And if I put the work first, I can fight through the nervousness. So that would be my answer. Um, at official underscore ly. Hey, you are amazing. Thank you. I appreciate you. You too. At chip underscore baby underscore still directing grays. Um, this season I was not able to. Um, so hopefully I'll be back. Maybe I'll be back. But um, I love directing that show. I love working with my wife. Um, that's super fun to go to work together uh, or go in separate cars, but arrive at the same place. Um, but uh, I will keep you posted. I, I would have been there this year, but the timing, uh, the episode schedule kept slipping and it ended up confront conflicting with something that uh, was already on the calendar. And I was kind of bummed that I couldn't do an episode this year. Um, and last but not least from KJ underscore Tommy, no question. I just wanted to say, I love your book so far. Well, I appreciate that brother. Thank you for, um, supporting it, man. This is Kelly Edwards, author of the executive chair. And you're listening to Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman. Transitions, a director's journey and motivational handbook is Pete Chapman's book from Michael Weezy Productions. What started in 1993 has been a marathon of persistence and creative pivots, transitioning from indie filmmaker to teaching at NYU's acclaimed film school, to running a production company, to directing television and commercials, and ultimately eyeing a return to the feature films that gave him his start. A mixture of how-to, self-help, and inspiration, this book is for any person targeting a successful career in the creative arts. Transitions, a director's journey and motivational handbook from Michael Weezy Productions. So, Moving to the book, I think coming off of these questions, what I'm going to do is read y'all the introduction to the book. Um, there's twofold. Uh, this works for a few reasons. Uh, one, uh, we're getting a deal to do the audio version of the book. So when I do that, um, it'll be nice to have done this part and kind of practiced a little for y'all. So y'all getting free or live practice. But also, um, for those of you who haven't picked the book up, I think it might be, uh, uh, you know, interesting to kind of hear the motivation behind the book. So I will read you the introduction to Transitions, A Director's Journey and Motivational Handbook. Here we go. Introduction. I've just got to get my foot in the door. How many times have you said that? Whether as a confidence booster or with bitterness and contempt because of how long the journey to being paid for your directing skills is taking, we all know that nothing is given to us. We all know that getting our feet in the proverbial door requires that we push ourselves and work the angles, running the marathon until opportunity meets preparation, and we can finally jam our Nikes into a sliver-sized opening from which we'll take the reins and, of course, never look back. But what if your idea of what it takes to get your foot in the door is just plain wrong, misguided, incomplete? What if your playbook is designed for the wrong sport entirely? This book is about the journey of the director and how to succeed within a landscape that is constantly shifting. I focus my lens on the transitions that many directors will be challenged with over the course of their career. I'll also share the principles I've learned about how to excel once you've ascended to each new rung on your director's ladder. I've made a variety of transitions over the course of my journey, going from short film director to director of a $520,000 independently financed feature film, indie feature director to NYU film school faculty, NYU faculty to creative director of my own digital studio while simultaneously directing my second feature film, creative director to episodic television director, episodic television director to executive producer and pilot director to author to fill in the blank. Let's be clear, transitioning from one directorial space to the next does not leave the previous craft behind. 
I'm still writing feature films, still creating branding. I'm still creating branded content and commercials through my digital studio, the director, and still sharing my experiences through teaching. You're holding the byproduct of that craft in your hands right now. And while all of the above may seem like easily executed logical next steps or lateral moves, trust me when I tell you that they were not. It took just as much focus and energy to transition between bullet points as it did to secure the prior accomplishment. I started at the proverbial bottom each and every time, but over the course of my journey, I began to realize that the principles of success, once identified, could be replicated. These principles were, in fact, the only reason I'd be able, the only reason I'd been able to transition from one directorial space to the next. In 2014, after six unsuccessful years of unrealized efforts to break into episodic television directing, I asked myself a series of probing existential questions. What's not working? What if everything I'm doing is wrong? How can I pivot? I knew I had what it takes. I've always been pretty confident but I clearly wasn't playing my cards right. Under closer analysis and with a lot of soul searching, I recognized that a lack of humility and gratitude had been crippling my progress. I had discounted the fact that each new directorial space was akin to graduating at the top of your senior class only to become a freshman with zero connections or clout at your next educational institution. I developed an underlying bitterness as I transitioned from directorial space to directorial space, climbing the ladder, all the while finding it impossible to segue into both episodic television directing and studio films. I'd done everything that I was told would make people see me, appreciate my talents, select me. But there I was making event videos for clients where I had to produce, shoot, cater, drive the van, edit, create graphics, and often more, just to deliver the job at the super low budgets we've been given. Now, I'm not thumbing my nose at those jobs in any way, as I learned a great deal as a storyteller and implement those lessons every episode of television that I continue to direct. But as far as the transition I was focused on making, I was unsatisfied and growing more bitter with every shoot. So what wasn't working? My bitterness, though I hadn't considered it, was driven by unrealized expectations. In social and professional settings, I was giving off a very potent aura of, I shouldn't even have to go through all of this because I went to Sundance or made two feature films or won this many awards. Again, I was a senior in my mind, but a freshman in standing. Who wants to work with that guy? Answering with brutal honesty, I knew I didn't. So why would anyone else? Was everything I was doing wrong? No, not everything. But if I was going to break into this new space of episodic television directing, I was going to have to add something new and singularly unique to showcase my abilities. I realized I'd been trying to write, sell, and direct projects that the industry would love, but that's a moving target and can be quite unsatisfying, even if you're lucky enough to strike it. I decided to make a short film, but with the mentality of my 11th grade self the teenager with a head full of dreadlocks that picked up a super eight millimeter film camera and made whatever he was most passionate about. The wide-eyed future director who examined each finished product with pride, unconcerned with the impact it would have on anyone else. He was unfulfilled, I'm sorry, he was fulfilled because he was working to master his craft and find his voice. I knew that guy was still in there somewhere. How to pivot. I would position this short film, Black Card, as my new conversation piece, my new calling card. I decided that it could no longer matter that I'd gone to Sundance with my NYU thesis, made two feature films, and won a competition at Tribeca Film Festival. Those milestones were 13, nine, and six years in the past, respectively. They didn't reap the rewards I had expected, and that would have to be all right. I was present with a new project and as excited as I'd ever been because I love telling stories. I would work to build a network of people in the industry who could educate me as to how episodic television works. I'd assume I knew nothing and I'd embrace the journey, illustrating my worth every day with the expectation that no one knows what I'm capable of and I can show them with passion, 
patience, and a pleasure for politics. Because frankly, working with people is politics. And that was the biggest pivot. And that was the biggest pivot I'd need to make. If I would be successful in directing multi-million dollar shows with crews of 100 or more people. The results. I'm happy to say that the actions triggered by my answers to the above questions have yielded results that have, if I'm being honest, surpassed my expectations. As I write this, I've directed both half hour single camera comedies and one hour dramas. I'm attached to direct the pilot for a premium cable network, and I'm pitching my first episodic series to major production companies with my sights on selling to a network in the coming months. I am also outlining my next feature film as I finish this book. Now let's get back to you. As you read this book, you'll notice that I've presented my experiences through three different lenses. Lens one, how to. You can't create your own sauce until you know the ingredients. Whether it's the early stages of finding your path or the intricacies of creating shot lists, I'll answer questions like, how do I find my voice? How do I raise money? How do I sell myself and design a good meeting? Lens two, self-help. Some folks master the how-to while perfecting the age-old craft of letting their emotions eliminate any possibility of success. They say you can't learn to control the horse until you can control yourself and your career is no different. From my experience, emotional intelligence, EQ, is the biggest factor or obstacle in ever being able to showcase your skills. To that end, you'll find a recurring section throughout the book entitled The Adjustment, where I'll take a time out to dissect a crucial decision that changed the trajectory of my career. For all of you directors, the adjustment is no different than the notes you'd give to an actor to get a better performance in take two. Why not apply our storytelling skills to our most important narrative, our very own hero's journey? Lens three, inspiration. Lastly, I know that I'm just one guy on one journey and some additional voices just might help this resonate with more impact. In the how I did it section of the book, I've invited some talented folks that inspire me to share their paths to directorial success with you. I hope this book will serve as a catalyst for the next steps of your journey. It's never too late to reflect, to ask questions, or to pivot. I also hope you'll share the roadmap of your success with your creative community. As far as I'm concerned, artists reaching their goals translates into a better world for us all. Lastly, I invite you to hit me up on social media so I can bear witness to the beauty of your transitions. Let's get to work. All right. So that is the introduction to Transitions, A Director's Journey and Motivational Handbook. That gives you a very clear outline of what the book is doing and what it will offer you. Uh, in a future um, episode, I'm gonna talk about um, how to design your blocking and coverage for television uh, in seven points. So I'm gonna do that uh, maybe next week, maybe after, I don't know, uh, I've got some great interviews coming up in the coming weeks uh, with some really talented actors and uh, showrunners that I've recently worked with. So I can't wait to bring that to y'all. Um, but as always, we are going to end with our standard outro, which is stay safe, spread love, and keep creating. Hope y'all enjoyed episode 35 of Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman. I'm out. What's up, people? This is Pete Chapman. Follow me on Instagram and on Twitter via at Pete Chapman. Follow the pod on Facebook on our Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman official page and hit up our mailbag with questions, suggestions, or hey, donations if you're feeling like it via Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman at gmail.com. And just in case you need to know how to spell it, that's Pete with the last name C-H-A-T-M-O-N.